my name is Rosalind Powell, and I am sitting down with Robbie Wells, our future president. Yeah. You like that? I do. <laughs> and we are going to discuss some things. I'm going to interview him and get to know him so everyone out there can get to know him as well. How are you this morning? I'm doing great. You're doing great? Yeah. Good. I know you guys had a long trip coming all the way over from St. Louis to Atlanta, but it's, yeah. it's truly an honor for you guys to be here at my home. Well, I am very happy to be here with you and meet with you, and I look forward to, you know, seeing you in my future. Well, thank you. You know? Appreciate that. So, uh... Whatever, no, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Oh, don't get nervous. Oh. I'm just a hey, listen, I'm just a guy. <laughs> I eat peanut butter on my crackers, just like everybody else. I, I put my pants on one leg at a time. Just one like leg at a time? One leg at a time, just like okay, everybody else. Okay, well, the nerves just went away just a little bit. Are we okay? good? <laughs> We're good. Okay. okay. So, you did give me a tour about your, around your house, and it's absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you. And I see you have so many pictures on your walls of just amazing things. So yeah. let's touch base on those. Okay, yeah. So I see at the beginning of your house, mm -hmm. you have pictures of you being in the military. Yeah, I did serve. I was briefly in the Army National Guard. Um, I went in in uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. I was 38 years old. Mm -hmm. And I was actually 20 years older than everybody else in my platoon when I went through basic training. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it was during the middle of the wars with Afghanistan and Iraq. I had been a college football coach for a number of years and had been telling my players that, you know, the military was a great honorable profession and they should consider that when they graduated from college. Um, I came to a point where I had a little bit of time and I said, you know what, I needed to probably put my money where my mouth was. So I did, I, I uh, went ahead and volunteered in 2006 when I was 38 years old during the middle of the wars with Afghanistan and Iraq and I uh, had to go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to do my training and it was in the summertime and they called it Fort Hell mm -hmm. and the reason they call it Fort Hell is because it's so hot there. Um, we had 17 days where it didn't go uh, below 100 degrees. Oh wow. Oh it was crazy crazy hot there and uh, uh, you know I think about my time there I made, made some great contacts with some some I call them my brothers mm. uh, from all over the country, and uh, it was neat to to be able to come in there and be a uh, a squad leader because I was older. They did look up to me. They called me coach, of course, because of my coaching background. But uh, you know, I, I was going in right when a guy named Pat, Pat Tillman uh, left the National Football League. He was playing for the Arizona Cardinals. And he felt the same way. He felt like he needed to serve his country during the middle of those wars. So he left his NFL career and went and served. And, of course, he was killed oh, in, in battle. So I had a lot of friends and family that were worried about me, too. I, did, I tried not to think about it. I know they prayed for me every day. And I prayed, of course, too. But um, I was not in very long in the military. But I do believe that I served my purpose. Mm -hmm. One, There was one night. Um, we had been out training and it had been hot for about 10 days straight, over 100 degrees. And uh, when we got back to the, to the barracks, everybody was ready just to crash out and go to sleep for a few hours. Um, in fact, we had. We had all you know, laid down on our cots and everything. And we had a rogue trainee that night that committed a terrorist act and took a knife and began stabbing our soldiers while they were laying in their bed trying to sleep. And so I played a role, along with a few others, in not only subduing him, but making sure that no one died that night. So I did play a role in saving 60 soldiers' lives that night. So uh, that was quite an eventful night. Um, we had several guys that acted really cool and calm about it. But, uh, you know, I looked back on it and I said, you know, maybe, just maybe, that was my purpose for serving in the military was to be able to help those young guys through that, that moment. I did go on back and coach some more after that, but uh, it was quite quite a memorable experience. It's a night that I'm never going to forget. In fact, I think about it every day, and I'm sure that the rest of the guys in that platoon do too. And, you know, I talk to, a, to several of them uh, on a regular basis. And, 
you know, we always talk about that night. Wow. So at that moment, what was going through your mind? What was going through my mind was, we're going to make sure that nobody dies tonight. Mm -hmm. And nobody died that night. That was the big thing. We did have a couple of guys that had to be chaptered out of the Army because they could no longer physically serve. Um, but nobody died that night. That's amazing. It's so great that you, you linked into action and you did well, that. That's... Well, it was, it was a lot of yeah. us. It was a lot of us that, uh, that took control of that situation. But, uh, yeah, I do remember that right after this rogue trainee did that, the rest of our platoon, the ones that were not injured, had jumped on him and they were they were gonna they were gonna kill him. Yeah. And that's when I came up and I said, No, stop. I yelled it. And they did. They stopped. And they looked at me and they listened. And I realized at that moment that these young kids, and they are for all practical purposes just kids, I was coaching guys older than them. Think about it. When I was coaching college ball. Uh, but these kids, they listened to me, and I was like, nobody's going to die tonight. We're going to hold this guy until the mil military police get here. And so we did. Uh, I also direct directed uh, some of our platoon leaders to take the injured down, because we were on the second floor in our barracks, take them downstairs outside, call for uh, you know the, the medical assistance to get there. And that, that happened. So, you know, it was just one of those, those nights that you'll never forget. Yeah. And you play it over and over and over again in your mind. So, yeah. Did that play a part with you leaving the military? No, it really didn't play a part with me leaving. Again, I, I was I was 20 years older than everybody else when I went in. Now, make no mistake, I graduated with honors mm -hmm. and uh, uh, was able to go through and, and stay right with them on the physical stuff. But I realized that this 38-year-old body was not an 18-year-old body. <laughs> So it was, it was definitely a great experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't give that up for anything. And it uh, gave me an opportunity to actually see the military side and understand what's going on. I, mean, I believe that, that every one of our leaders should, should have the opportunity to serve like that, mm -hmm. even if it's briefly like I did. But, um, uh, you know, it was, it was quite an experience. Yeah, it sounds like it. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So I hear you say that you were a coach. What did you coach? I did. I was a college football coach for college 20 football. years. Yeah, I coached at the University of South Carolina mm -hmm. uh, when Luke Holtz was there. Mm -hmm. He had left Notre Dame and come down to uh, South Carolina, and we had the greatest turnaround in college football. Mm -hmm. We were the worst team when he got there, and then after being there a year, we turned that thing completely around and ended up doing some great, great things and winning a bunch of games. and. Then I went from there to South Carolina State as the defensive coordinator, and I did that for four years. We, we won a championship while I was there, won a bunch of games. It was great. And then uh, I did something that most people never get the opportunity or even would think about doing. Um, I was named head football coach at an NCAA Division I black school oh, wow. at Savannah State University. I was the first white guy to ever do that. And uh, people thought I was crazy to take that program because it was the worst in the country. But I saw it as being crazy if I didn't take it because it was such a great opportunity. There was nowhere really to go but up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our first year there, we won as many games as the previous five years combined before I got there. And uh, we were definitely on our way. And, uh, you know, people in Savannah, they thought we'd won the Super Bowl. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I was there for two years, and then that made 20 years of coaching and being an educator, and I figured that was about enough, mm -hmm. and uh, I always knew that I was going to get into politics. So on November the 21st, 2011, uh, right there in, George, in Washington Square in Savannah, I did announce mm -hmm. that I was going to run for president, and this has been a process. It's not just a, a one-and-done type thing, okay? It's... It's not one of those whims that I had. I've, I've known since I was a little child that I was going to do it. But I truly believe in this country that if you want something, you want it bad enough, okay, and your drive determines your destination, you can go get it. I started my campaign with literally nothing. It was just God to me. That was it. Because right, you have a background in politics. Well, I got a little bit of a background in politics. I do. My father um, actually worked with our, our one of our former presidents, with Jimmy Carter, 
when he was actually the governor right here in this state in Georgia. And uh, my father sat on a committee that oversaw the special needs kids mm -hmm. in the state of Georgia because my older sister who passed uh, 13 years ago, but she was special needs. So it was a great fit. But I, I knew Jimmy Carter as a very young child from probably the time I was four on. And then when I was eight years old, a few days before the election in 1976, we were actually at his home there in Plains, Georgia. And I was running around playing like a little kid would. Amy Carter was also a little kid. She's running around playing. We're having a good time. And then in comes Governor Carter. And I remember looking up at him because he was such a cool guy. Still is. Okay, he's in his 90s now. But I remember looking up at him and saying, you're going to be the president of the United States. And he looked down at me and he says, one day you will be too. And that really kind of stuck with me. You know, as an eight-year-old kid, it, it just put a stamp of inspiration on me that, you know, if my family friend could do it, why could not do it? That's right. Make it happen. Make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That is absolutely yeah. amazing. So after that, tell us about when you were younger, you say that you are a miracle? I am a miracle. I am a complete miracle. I shouldn't even be here in man's eyes. You see, I'm going to tell you a story. This beautiful young girl went away to college on a music scholarship. And quickly, everybody in this school realized just how talented she was. She was going to sell out concert halls. She was a lead singer. In fact, she already was because in the summer times, she was going across country as the lead singer for this band. And they were selling out concert halls. She was great. But like most young girls, she ended up falling in love. But the man that she fell in love with was older and he had a family. One thing led to another, she got pregnant. And everybody told her, it's just a blip on the radar, don't ruin your career. Go ahead and terminate this pregnancy and keep on going, just keep on moving. Wow. To the point where they set her up an appointment to terminate. And at the last minute, that beautiful young girl said, nope, I'm gonna go ahead and put this child up for adoption, give this child a chance. Now I've always said if I could ever meet that beautiful young lady, I'd thank her for setting my life in motion, because mm -hmm. that's my birth mother. Well, two years ago, I met her. How was that? It was incredible. It was incredible. She actually lives right here in the state of Georgia, too. So I've actually uh, got two mothers now, my adopted mom that raised me mm -hmm. and my birth mother. And they only live about two hours apart from each other. But I'm very blessed because there's not many people on the face of this planet that can say they have two moms that absolutely mm -hmm. adore them. That's true. You have more love than to give. Right? I'm telling you, I really do. <laughs> and, and I was actually on the road. I was up in New York when I received a phone call uh, from a group here in Atlanta saying that they were an adoption reunion registry and that uh, my birth mother had been looking for me. And so um, they sent me a letter that she had written to me. And I immediately knew that, that it was her because I had seen some adoption papers on me. You know, my, my parents, my adopted parents never hid it from me. I've, I've known I was adopted for forever. But I saw some papers where my name was Baby Andy uh, before I was adopted. And the letter starts out, Dear Andy. So I knew that it was her. So uh, Helen Crawford is my birth mother. And she does live uh, about an hour and a half from the lab. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really been great because uh, when the first time I actually met her, she had a surprise for me. And I actually got to meet my 95 year old grandmother as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a neat experience. Now she passed uh, just this, this past uh, July, but I did get a chance to meet Grandma Christine, which was a neat experience. But my birth mother and my adopted mom Mom Wells and Mom Crawford have become really good friends. And whenever we have holidays, we actually all get together now. It's really cool. Wow, that is cool. It is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So meeting your mother, well, receiving that letter, letter from her, how did that make you feel at that moment? Um, well, when I read the letter, it, it let me know that I needed to let her know that I was okay because she had worried for many, many years mm -hmm. that she had made the wrong decision. Uh, of giving me up for adoption and uh, you know she wanted to make sure that I was in good health this that and the other so I actually read it to my adopted mom 
I read the letter to her over the phone. I said, we got to go make it right with this lady and let this lady know she made a good decision. I've turned out okay. I'm good. And so that's exactly what we did. I took my, my adopted mom with me and we all met and everything's great. We're just all friends now. It's great. That is great. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. You have quite the story. Yeah. It's amazing. That is. It's a story now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a beautiful one. And now look at you, you're heading to become our future president. Yeah, hopefully I'll end up being America's do adopted son. Mm -hmm. so, you know. <laughs> so once you're in office, what are some of the... Um, pol the, the, the things I want to do? Yes. Well, here, here's the thing that I'm going to tell you. I look at our country right now. We've got a huge divide. We're split yeah. on many different issues. The biggest one is race, mm -hmm. and it's always been that way. And I've, you know, I, I've always said, and, and and not to bash any opponents. I'm not trying to bash anybody, but my opponent in 2020 and the current president says, "Make America great again," which insinuates we've been great before. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay, when Mr. Trump's ancestors came over here, mm -hmm. okay, and, and ran all the Native Americans off their land, and you've heard of the Trail of Tears where over 75 million Native Americans lost their lives. What, was it great for them? No. It was not great for them. And, and then from the onset of our country in 1776 until the 1860s, we had slavery. Was it good for African Americans? Not at all. I don't think so either. Okay, and then. From 1860 up until the 1920s, you had children being exploited in all these factories across the country. I don't think it was great for those children either. Not at all. Not at all. And then after the 20s, you, you go straight into the Depression mm -hmm. until the 40s, okay? You had millions of people that lost their homes, divorce, suicide. I don't think it was great for them either. Some people in some places at some time. Okay, America's done some really good things. We went to the moon. We did all this stuff. But think about this. After that, then you had... Malcolm X, you had Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy, they were all assassinated. They were. I don't think it was great then either. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't think it was great during the Jim Crow era for African Americans either. Uh, so, so if you think about it, you know, Mr. Trump, you say make America great again, but when was it great for everybody at one time? I truly believe that America will be great once the lines of separation that have divided this nation are completely erased. And that's what I'm going to do as president. Wow. You heard it yourself. That's what you're looking forward to. So. That's the first thing we're going to do. That's the first. Now, we're, all, we're the only Western industrialized nation that does not have free college tuition and free health care for every American. But my plan sees that happen. Free health care, free college tuition, the elimination of the $1.4 trillion in student loan debt. And I know how we're going to pay for all of it. I also have a plan that sees our country become 100% sustainable energy independent so that we no longer have to rely on the Middle East for oil. It gets us out of all the wars we've been in since 1991. We've been in constant conflict in the Middle East for the last 27 years that I can think of, and even before that. So if we keep on doing what we're doing, we're going to keep on getting what we're getting, right? So maybe now it's time for new leadership to come in with new ideas. But my plan does create millions of, of good paying jobs in the manufacturing industry to achieve sustainable energy independence. Gets us out of all the wars in the Middle East. At the same time, provides millions of Americans with great paying six-figure jobs. Okay? And at the same time, it cleans up our environment. We've only got one planet. There is no planet B that we no. can move to. Planet Earth is planet A, okay, and there is nothing else out there. So if we don't take care of this planet and reverse the effects of global warming, we're not going to have a planet. Now think about this, okay. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to, to remember, but about 20 years ago, we had Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida. And everybody said, oh, it did all this devastation, and it did. But Irma and Harvey, that hit last year, they were about 20 times the size and strength of Andrew. So all of that comes from global warming, so we've got to reverse those effects. And, you know, I, I know that the, the oil industry is a, is a big money maker and, and, you know, it's all about the money to them, but I do have a plan if they'll get on board where they can actually make more money than what they're making right now 
if they will move in the direction of sustainable energy independence. So I'm looking forward to that opportunity to be able to sit down with these uh, fossil fuel leaders, or, you know, across across the globe. Actually, uh, I also want to work with uh, with India. India is the largest democracy on the face of this planet. They've got 1.4 billion people there. We, we partner with them when it comes to education, like our college students go there, theirs come here. But I want to do so much more. Could you imagine if our two nations come together to achieve sustainable energy independence? Okay, you're talking about almost one-third of the world's population cleaning up the environment. And here's what happened. Yeah, it would be amazing. Now think about this. If, if India does it, well, right next door is China, and China will not be outdone by India. So you know China's going to jump on board, which means Russia jumps on board. And if we're doing it, you know that all of Europe's going to do it. So all of a sudden, we've cleaned up our environment. And that's, that's my plan. You know, John F. Kennedy, when he was president, okay, when he first went in in 61, he gave a speech. And he said, it's my goal to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. But we did it. We went to the moon, right? We did. Well, it's my goal by the end of my second term to see free college education, the elimination of student loan debt, free health care, 100% sustainable energy independence. Why? Not because it's easy. Because it's hard. Okay? Because it's hard and it's the right thing to do. It is. It's the yeah. right thing to do. And that will make a lot of people happy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So, um... Could you touch a little bit more into that, that free education, the bringing that down and, you know, like what are your... Bringing it to zero cost for every, yeah. everybody? Can you just, you know, touch a little bit more on that? Yeah. What do you intend on doing that? Well, you know, one of my opponents in 2016 actually talked about it, but he didn't know how to pay for it, in my humble opinion. But uh, here's how we're going to do it. It takes roughly 60 billion dollars a year to educate our young people in all the state universities and colleges across this country. Sixty billion dollars, okay? But we waste over thirty billion dollars chasing down young people that smoke marijuana and putting them in prison. That is so true. Now, let me just say this. I don't smoke marijuana, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't drink alcohol. But those that choose to, that, that should be their deal. So as president, what I want to do is decriminalize across the entire country, save that $30 billion, then regulate the industry, tax the industry, and create another $30 billion annually. That's $60 billion. We're going to take that $60 billion and we're going to make college education free. Wow. I like that. Yeah. Then more people will go to actually go to college. They will go to college, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I'm all about people having their, their, their freedom and their liberty to, to do as they want. And I know that there's some conservatives out here. They're going to say, oh, he's trying to legalize drugs and this, that, and other. Listen, what I'm going to tell you is, if you look back in history, history has a tendency of re repeating itself. You look back in the 20s, we had the prohibition of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Okay, the government was fighting anybody that had or was trying to make liquor, this, that, and the other. It didn't work. So what did the government decide to do? They made it legal. They, made it legal, they regulated the industry, they taxed the industry, and they've, it's, it's been, you know, great for revenue. Mm -hmm. We need to do the same thing with marijuana as well. Plus, it'll cut down on all the, all the illegal drug trafficking from Central and South America that does come into the United States. So you want to talk about border security? Mm -hmm. Legalize marijuana. That'll help it. You know, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the student loan debt. We're at $1.4 trillion, right? Mm -hmm. That's $1.4 trillion out there that is hanging over the heads of American citizens that we're trying to get ahead. And yet, our federal government profits on those student loans. That's wrong, okay? Yet our federal government then takes $60 billion. There's that 60 again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They take $60 billion every year and... and supply foreign aid. Now we're going to start taking care of our own backyard or we're not going to have a backyard. So as president what I want to do is cut that foreign aid in half. I don't want to cut it completely out because we've got to be able to help our friends and our neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. But I do want to take 30 billion of it and apply it towards that student loan debt every year. Once we put that into action, everybody that's got a student loan, it goes away. It's now back on the federal government, which is where it should be. You know, if you go to, if you go to Europe, 
they all have free college education. In fact, there's some nations that actually pay their students to go get a bachelor's degree. It's, it's like work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got to get to that point here in the United States. We rank 36 in the world in education. That's not good enough. That's not. 35 countries ahead of us. Okay? We've got to start educating our kids at a younger age. That's why I've got universal child care. We've got over 17 million single moms out here raising over 20 million children. Okay? A lot of them get caught up in a system that fails them. And it doesn't just fail them, it fails the taxpayers that have to pay that system. Okay? So instead of doing that, let's do this. Let's give everyone free child care, universal child care. Let's free up all these single moms now so they can go back to school, free college, or go back to work. Okay? And we're going to bring those jobs in like I was telling you. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big plan that we've got to make this country what it was always intended to be. The beacon of freedom for everybody, but you can't truly have freedom until you've got economic freedom. And we've got over 50 million Americans living in poverty right here, and half our population existing on low income. That's not good enough. This is the United States, okay? We're supposed to be the melting pot. We're supposed to be where everybody can come and have a chance, okay? I mean, you take a little guy like me, okay? I'm just a miracle to be here, right? My father was a minister in some very small little churches in, in the South, in the deep South. The, the thought of somebody like me sitting right here talking to you with a legitimate shot, shot of being president is this close to being a miracle, if, if not a true miracle. So, you know, if it can happen for me, it should be able to happen for anybody. Okay, and I'm, I'm one of those that truly believes that we've got to put a system in place that gives everybody a chance. So, Ravi, I wanted to ask you about um, the school shootings. Like, what are your thoughts and what kind of plans would you like to put in place with that? Because it's just been really bad. really has been bad. Uh, a lot of people get this, this completely twisted. Mm -hmm. You know, I was an educator and a coach for 20 years. And uh, I understand the problems with education. Um, I remember back in 2012 exactly what I was doing when Sandy Hook when that tragedy occurred and those, I call them babies, those six and seven year old babies. children were killed. That's right. So we do have a problem with gun violence in this country. Uh, I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe that every American has, every law abiding, mentally competent American has the right to bear arms, protect their family, protect their property, protect themselves. Uh, but we have a few people out here that get it twisted. We really do. There's a few things and a few steps that I think that we could take that would actually protect every children, every child in every school across this country. My plan is called Vets for Kids. We can take our unemployed veterans, screen them and train them, and put them back to work in every school across this country as guardians for our children. And as President of the United States, until Congress actually gives me a bill signing it into law, I'm going to sign an executive order on day one, putting our veterans in every school across this country. And no, that is not posi comitatus because veterans are actually considered civilians. Mm -hmm. But they've taken an oath to protect our, our people. And that oath is not just for when they serve, it's a lifetime oath. So we're going to take our veterans, we're going to put them in every school, and I want to show you how serious this is right now. You know, I believe we lost eight people yesterday at El Paso uh, High School in uh, El Paso, Texas, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or excuse me, Santa Fe, in Santa Fe. Uh, then we lost uh, a number of, of people in South Florida on Valentine's Day. And you can go back and, and back and you'll see this. So my plan is actually uh, going to save these people's lives. Imagine if I was president right now and we had already signed that executive order, okay, while we were waiting on Congress to put a bill on my desk uh, to, a, to completely enact it. Those, those people will be alive right now. Those families would still be out here having a good time because, you know, when, when a child gets ready to go to school every day, he should be worrying and concerned about the test he is going to take or that she is going to take. She should not have to be sitting there taking a test and looking over her shoulder to make sure bullets aren't flying. That's going to change when I become president. And we're going to put this in place to, to take care of those children. So with putting the veterans in schools, do you feel as if Putting guns in school is also necessary? Well, I, I do not agree with our, our current president. Our current president 
uh, wants to arm teachers. Uh, I do not believe that that is the answer at all. Let's don't arm the teachers. The teachers are there to actually educate. They're not there to 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 to, to be the the security. But we can take these veterans that are already trained uh, for situations like this to actually be able to take it. So we're going to tell the psychopaths that are out there, and there are a few of them, okay? And I hope that you're listening today because when I become president, my veterans are going to be given the green light that if you come on that campus trying to do the wrong thing, they're given the green light to take you out. You heard it yourself. So I also wanted to touch with you um, okay. about your personal life. Okay, yeah, sure. See, you're married. And no. You're, no, you're not married. No, no. I'm single. You're single. Single guy running for president of the United States. But I will say this. Um, there is a, a beautiful lady that uh, in the event that this gets very, very serious with the American people, mm -hmm. uh, that I will introduce to the country. Oh, can we get a little snippet of who no, she might be? No, I can't do that. <laughs> I tried, I tried. I can't do that, and I'm going to tell you why, okay? I want her to be able to have a normal life for as long as possible. And as soon as we go public, mm -hmm. she's not going to be able to have a normal life anymore. I understand. So well, we're going to wait. How did you meet her? Um, well, I actually met her a few years ago, about four years ago, mm -hmm. uh, while I was out campaigning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we've been friends for the whole time, but she's she's quite an inc incredible person. She really is. She'd be a great first lady. She has you smitten. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's blushing you all. Yeah. yeah. So, any children? Yes, I have over 1,000 children. For all of you out there, all of my former football players. <laughs> oh, your former football players. That's right. So, anyone that we know that you've coached? I, I've coached some guys that uh, that have done some really great things in sports. Uh, probably about 25 guys that went on and played in the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the one that really stands out was Anthony Wright. Anthony, I, I coached him at the University of South Carolina. He was the first starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys after... Troy Aikman retired, and uh, Anthony finished his career with the Giants back in 2007 when they actually beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. So he was the backup quarterback for Eli Manning. Um, John Abraham, that was a first-round draft pick. Um, you know, I could go on and on. You know, Kevin House and uh, Willie Offord and uh, Arturo Freeman was an All-American that uh, that I was his position coach there at the University of South Carolina. He went on and played for about nine years. Uh, with the Miami Dolphins. Sheldon Brown. Sheldon Brown played with the uh, Eagles and uh, he also played with the Browns. But it was Sheldon Brown that actually helped me break into college coaching. He was just a high school kid and uh, and I saw him mm -hmm. and uh, discovered Sheldon Brown in the state championship of, of this very small little high school, one of the smallest high schools in the state of South Carolina. And uh, I took it to the coaches there at USC. I was just coaching high school football then. Mm -hmm. And so they looked into it and he was legit like I said and they offered him a scholarship he took it and then the next thing I know they they're calling me on the phone saying you've got a great eye for talent would you like to coach college football and I was like sure so that's how I broke into college football was because of Sheldon Brown wow yep that's amazing. right there in Richburg South Carolina he went to Louisville High School so you have a lot of sons <laughs> I got a lot of sons, lot of sons. I, I do I've got over a thousand of them and you know some of them would get mad at me because, you know, when you're a coach, sometimes you've got to give them that tough love. Oh, it's still love, but oh, sometimes it's tough. it's tough love. But I'm really proud. For the most part, these guys have gone on and done great things. I've got doctors. I've got lawyers. I've got teachers, coaches. I've got a guy that's actually uh, an officer in the United States Army. And, uh, you know, to be able to see these guys going and do these great things is amazing. So it sounds like family reunions at your house is amazing. So well, the fam <laughs> I want to have a family reunion at the White House with all of them. Yes, yeah. and just make sure I'm on the list. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So um, we're going to, is there anything that you would like to say to everyone out here that you feel that you should get across to them? Sure, sure. If, if you would like to uh, learn more about the campaign, please go to riseupwithrobbie.com. That's riseupwithrobbie.com. It's Robbie with a Y. 
And when you get there, you're going to see all the social media links so you can get up-to-date information on that site. You can also get my bio there, uh, my plan, which is called Eagleomics. Eagleomics takes the best from the left wing and the right wing. I believe it's about time that, that we have a president that can see the beauty in both sides and represent all the people instead of just part of the people. So go to the website, and we need your help. We've got a long way to go, and with each and every one of you, we can get this done and make the positive changes for our country come 2020. Well, you heard it here yourself. Make sure you go out and check out the website and learn all you can about Mr. Robbie Wells. And thank you so much for sitting down with me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, this has been great.